Hello, we are very uh, pleased to present a new book, Artists and the Practice of Agriculture, Politics and Aesthetics of Food Sovereignty in Art Since 1960 by Sylvia Bottinelli. Sylvia reached out to us a few years back when she was putting this book together uh, to uh, ask us a series of questions which are published in this book. We thought it opportune as the book has now arrived in our hot little hands to share those questions and our answers with you. These questions were sent to us in 2020. In this audio presentation, Meg reads as Sylvia Bottinelli and I, Patrick, read on behalf of the collective. We hope you enjoy a conversation with Artist as Family. In what ways does the name Artist as Family describe what you do? There is not a privileging of artist and non-artist distinctions in our household. Cultural, creative and generative productions occur each day and involve many participants, human and much more, family and much more. Artist as Family composts Artist as Solo Hero and speaks to subsistence and distributed culture making and post-market productions. The name and practice call for our attention to engage in generative production where participation, process, experimentation and meaning making are not ends in themselves. Rather, these things are families of circularity. How do art and life merge in your practice? sometimes described as a 10-year-long piece of performance art. Permaculture's principle, integrate, don't segregate, is a conceptual lever for our practice, where meaning-making, or permapoesis, integrates generative art into generative life way. Permapoesis speaks to both the endurance processes of permanence and the acting and making poesis that derives from the permaculture portmanteau, permanent culturing. Economy, which in our case can be described as generative subsistence and gift exchange, and culture making, is inseparable. The economy we make is the culture we make, and the culture we make is the economy we make. What is the art historical genealogy in which you inscribe your work? We draw on the rituals, rites, celebrations and cultural economies of First Peoples, especially our own First Peoples peasant animist traditions from Europe and the Middle East. We nonetheless have been schooled in Western philosophy and such criticality is not absent from our practice. This hybrid state we call neo-peasantry, the neo locating various privileges and schoolings. While we don't appropriate customs, ritual or costumes, or live in an antique romance state, we do draw on old story and ancestral wisdom and bring it forward. The story of Druid universities, for example, where the university is situated in great oak forests and the professors are the trees themselves, this moving away from Socratic, via Plato, anthropocentricism. Quote, I have nothing to learn from trees and fields. I only have things to learn from men of cities. End quote. Has been central, not only to opening to multi-species culture and consciousness, but also in attending to toxic patriarchy. Such gender lopsidedness in Western culture became systemic after the witch hunts that began in the 13th century, though probably begins much further back with Hesiod, the misogynist poet, 2,700 years ago. Hesiod rewrote the theology of his day to diminish Greek goddesses like Pandora to a pre-Eve-like state, transforming her from the goddess of fermentation and abundance to the mortal who brought suffering to man. The witch hunts led to the diminishment of feminine popular power, herbalism, midwifery, fermenting, dispute resolving, 
within our peasant ancestries and cultural traditions to an extreme next level. Out of the witch hunts, which also saw to the diminishment of village, forest, domestic, wild interrelationships, grew mercantile forms of art relations based on synthetic or urban imperatives that classical Greek philosophy had built a temple to centuries before. More recently, performance and land art movements have also been formative before we arrived at permapoesis, as have popular cultural forms such as parkour and doing sane poetics, physical theatre, folk music, graffiti and culinary cultures. However, while artist as family is foremost a practice of poetic, pragmatic meaning-making, it has also been a practice that has very consciously moved away from bourgeois and mercantile forms of art culturing, forms and modalities which we were exposed to and influenced by as students of university art and media departments. In what ways does your experience celebrate childhood and raising children? Our practice seeks to incorporate a free-to-learn cosmology, which evolutionary biologist Peter Gray speaks to in his critique of Western schooling. We learn through play, through grief, by making mistakes, by cutting ourselves and falling down, and our children and the many other children we interact with are constant reminders of ancient instinctual intelligence we all embody. Children are our link to pre-literacy. They remind us how possible it is to be present in the living of the world and the imaginal realm. They don't name the world in total, although words to them hold magical powers. Rather, they sense the words of the world, giving us insight into the possibilities of a fuller presence and thus showing us little paths to reclaiming relationships that are much more than human that is, reclaiming relationships to words and naming that are spoken in and of their breath, by honouring this intrinsic state, this exploration into life, and by giving them space and time for non-prescriptive play and languaging, we celebrate children, learn from them, and celebrate our own way back into animus states of belonging. Children play and experience the world in context with an immediate presence that roots them in place. Allowing this to take place, and indeed learning from it, is one powerful way of celebrating children and their natural state of interbelonging. Your property in central Victoria, Australia, is significant to artists as family. If we could take a tour there, what would we see? Our home, which we call Tree Elbow, is an example of intense garden agriculture situated at the edge of suburbia and the Wombat Forest. We live in a small street of social warming neighbours who we gift exchange with and share community responsibilities that include childminding, creek restoration, bushfire mitigation, planting and tending a community orchard and working with goats to reduce the dominance of weed species in this novel ecology, thus helping to return indigenous biota to country. As you walk into Tree Elbow through a food forest that begins on the street verge, there are numerous gardens and small dwellings. No cars can access the narrow in-paths from the street. There is a main home building orientated to capture winter sun and repel summer radiation. There are many smaller buildings used for non-monetized learning opportunities for live-in students who trade labor for learning. There are food forests, perennial gardens, aimed at integrating indigenous biota with low-input perennial food productions. There is a series of rain-catching swales that follow the contour of the land to passively harvest rain, which double as paths that run along annual food production beds. There is an extensive poultry area for chickens and ducks, eggs, manure and meat, and an apiary for bees, pollination services and high-protein honeycomb. There are 
social warming fences that enable conversations with neighbors while keeping animals inside the quarter acre property. There are multiple sheds, frost protecting structures and glass houses, a nursery area, a cookhouse or sauna, and cold water plunge tank, innumerable water tanks, compost bays and children's play and social spaces, including a tree house in an ancestral oak. A stable area for nanny goats and their newborns exists under the house, which is large enough to enclose the herd of 12 or so goats in extreme bushfire weather. Next to this is a cellar that we built using stones unearthed from the annual garden in which we store food year round. How do you honour the legacy of the Jarrah peoples who were the first custodians of the land where you live? We live with the problem of dwelling on unceded land and we have only just begun in the last decade to work within the materiality of this. We listen to Jara and other First Peoples eldership and Jara community voices by organising or attending talks and ceremonies. We are learning to deepen our roles as custodial species. We have initiated and continue to organise the annual Terranalius breakfast, which takes place outside our local town hall and annually marks the historical lie of terrestrial ownership of Australia, particularly as it relates to Jarrah country. We engage Jarrah eldership and participation in new rituals and rites such as the four-day listening to country initiation fast which we facilitate. We honour with our own First Peoples their cultural and economic relationships with Jarrah cosmology and recognise ourselves as Second Peoples on Jarrah land. Reclaiming our own First People stories deepens our connection to Jarrah ancestors and contemporaries. We practice daily rituals of listening to the land and its many actors, animate and inanimate, who we consider teachers. There are six seasons in Jarrah country, a winter and an autumn, two distinct summers and two springs. Observing these seasons enables us to better honour Jarrah perceptions and intimate knowledges of country. As the seasonal changes are triggered by plant and animal behaviours rather than imposed upon by a Eurocentric idea of seasonality. How do death and decay play a role in your work with the farm? We honour death and decay as teachers. Death and decay are as significant as birth, consumption, growth and renewal within our form of permacultural subsistence economy, which we call neo-peasantry. Humanure compost is the heart soil of our plant food productions. All our human waste is safely returned to the soils, thus closing what we call the poop loop. We use our sifted fire waste for potash, and the charcoal soaked in our urine makes an activated biochar. We return both these byproducts to our gardens and the nearby forest commons. We only eat animals we kill ourselves or that have been killed consciously by friends who practice respectful slaughtering processes and who honour the life taken in some form of ritual, as we do ourselves. We eat little meat, but the killing of animals brings us into regular contact with the materiality of death and the transmission of souls from one form into another. Mortality acceptance has been critical to our cultural and behavioural transformations, which are aided and deepened by practices of breathwork, meditation, deep listening and cold water plunging. Fermentation, which is a major cultural practice in our household, is the courting of microecology to slow down the decaying process of our home-grown fruit and vegetables. Being daily fermenters deepens our awareness of the importance of death and decay as does living seasonally and within cycles of renewal, which so critically require death and decay. How do you incorporate permaculture into your project on both a practical and a conceptual level? Holmgren's permaculture principles and ethics encircle and embody our practice pragmatically and conceptually. They inform our approaches to caring for country, community, each other and ourselves. We understand that self-care is required foremost if one wishes to be in service to others. 
The principles and ethics enable a collaborative life practice of integration and interrelationship between human and other than human entities, of producing little or no waste, incorporating broad definitions of biodiversity, applying self and family regulations after incorporating both human and more than human feedback, growing non-monetized economies of home place where rituals of return are made and gifts flow between generous actors or to those in need. We have used the principles and ethics of permaculture as a framework to act and speak another cultural reality that while may not be fully independent from the dominant cultural economic realm, demonstrates the possibility, through small-scale modelling, of post-capital relations with economy, especially concerning food, art, medicine and energy productions. Additionally, our practice is feral, and while permaculture principles grow the village wisdom of our day-to-day, -day, it is weed and feral consciousness that is our ancestral biota that develop our minds to open to forest wisdom and multi-species culturing. Across the years, you have collected knowledge through experience and observation. What is the importance of spreading the knowledge that you have collected, and how do you disseminate such knowledge? Sharing our knowledges, experimentation and experience is for us, in keeping with the spirit of commons and thus the politics of strategic degrowth and what we call a flow of gifts belonging. It is keeping with the spirit of non-privatised learning and open source passed down knowledges we ourselves have benefited significantly from. The great majority of what we share does not reside behind paywalls or within capital relations. We do occasionally produce an artefact where either money or formal barter exchange is required. We see knowledge sharing akin to ecological succession. Well-being resides not in debt to money, but in indebtedness to the living of the world. We facilitate non-monetary workshops ranging from fermentation, natural beekeeping, orchard care, soil health, herbal medicine, seed saving, annual vegetable gardening, community forestry and community gardening. And we run non-monetary bush skills for children where parents are encouraged to gift excess produce in exchange for the learning. All of this teaching, formally and informally, occurs under the umbrella of the School of Applied Neo-Peasantry at Tree Elbow University. We encourage young people not to go into debt for an industrial degree at a university, but to become instead self-learners. At this point, the internet still enables an incredible commons of knowledge, and we contribute to this in our open source videos on our YouTube page, through our writings on our blog, and via our freely available resources page. We also hold regular house and garden tours to the public, and for permaculture design course participants, for which we charge a small fee. Can you share examples of tools, species, processes, that you have found rewarding in your practice? Our practice is broader than agriculture and we draw on our hunter-gatherer gardener ancestors to augment our cultural economy. For example, our seven-year-old son Blackwood has just dug up some clay from beside a nearby creek. It is dark gold in colour and quite sticky and he is rolling it into small balls. Later this morning, after we have baked our bread and the wood oven is still hot, he will cook the small balls to use as pellets in his homemade slingshot, the making of which was yesterday's self-initiated project. He may spend the afternoon hunting rabbits in the forest alongside Zero, our Jack Russell Terrier, and Chief Rabbiter. They will sit patiently and observe the communities of life in the forest while they await their prey. If successful, we will have rabbit liver pâté, on our fresh bread for tomorrow's lunch, rabbit stew for dinner, and then bone broth the following day. All these meals will be cooked by our wood stove, which runs eight appliances, fueled by walked-for or bicycled wood energy from the gorilla-inspired community-managed forests we are custodians of. This is Blackwood's main classroom as an unschooled child, if we are to take school as meaning 
derived from the Prussian militarism of the Teutonic Knights, which industrial schooling, and indeed culture, is founded upon. We will add the rabbit's tanned pelt after it is salted, dried, scraped and softened to our growing collection to sew into our first rabbit skin coat. While we are technical animals, cyborgs, we increasingly foreground knowledge and background technology akin to ecological cultures of place who worship the earth as mother, Gaia or goddess and are open to instruction and wisdom from more than human consciousness. Thus we don't grow our dependency purely on industrial digital technologies. Biological processes intersect with low-tooled labours such as using a shovel and a small electric chainsaw to build a series of weirs to create pools in a human degraded creek from where Blackwood finds his clay near to where he hunts. These two tools, one with a repaired handle from forest timber, the other part of the global expansion of electric battery tools that is causing much suffering in countries like Bolivia, aid ecological succession, rehydration and rehabilitation of that ecology. We limit small or large machinery from such works. Once there are a dozen pools along the creek, the intention is to return indigenous fish to this upper tributary which will act as a breeding biome to supply indigenous fish and other aquatic life downstream, as well as occasional food for our neighbours and us. The fallen timbers we use to build the weirs will themselves break down eventually, but plant life and wash down debris should maintain the weirs as pools. Another such process is using goats to eat the dominant weed species in the forest. By using electric fences and the solar pack, we have found that the cell grazing of goats has enabled indigenous plants to return to country, transforming the ecology from weedy, fire-prone forests into grassy woodlands that then can be managed by indigenous herbivores, jara, cool burn methods, and light grazing of goats, if still required. While managing the goats is firstly a service to the forest and the community, especially with growing bushfire threats, we eat the surplus of male goats throughout the year and are beginning to teach ourselves how to make shoes with the skins. You choose to model community-sufficient ways of life, modes of survival that depend on close interactions with the plots that you inhabit, but also the neighbouring community. This shows alternatives to the reliance on industrially produced products, even those that corporations claim to be sustainable, sometimes as a form of greenwashing, others to advertise more genuine concern for the environment. Can you talk about the difference between self-sufficiency and community sufficiency? Self-sufficiency might be a powerful antidote to consumer culture if you are self-reliant in terms of the food you eat, the water you catch and the energy you provision and store. Community sufficiency describes a more connected, interrelated way of being with human and other than human communities in what we call one's locosphere. We are advancing the term community sufficiency to describe a walked-for food, energy and medicine cosmology. We are in a gift exchange relationship with over 80 other households. We gift a jar of honey from our bees and we are gifted back a bucket of cow's milk. We edit a chapter of a book and we are helped with weeding in our garden. Community sufficiency underpins our relationship to our human community and neighbours, as it does our goats, for example, who we gorilla farm on the nearby common land. The goats eat the dominant weed species while the manures fertilise the forest floor to help grow more food and habitat for other species to flourish. As described above, goats are also land managers providing a social good for the town, which is vulnerable to bushfires. The goats provide meat and skins, grown simply from unwanted weeds, and like our bees, forage their own food and supply us protein that has no industrial inputs. Community sufficiency describes our interrelationship with the living of the worlds, a conscious mutuality. What we breathe in, the trees breathe out, and an understanding of interbelongingness, the flower gives itself to the insects, and birds who gift pollination in return. 
we don't perceive economy as mere mechanics, as human-centric distribution systems. We see it as complex and relational, as deep connection, as animist and shape-shifting, and at times beyond human comprehension. And this not knowing and complexity informs our culturing away from domination economics into interbelonging. Therefore, community sufficiency is a state of interbelonging where frugal or sufficient amounts of food, medicine, energy and other gifts are not overly consumed. It is a relationship between limits and abundance. What are the limits of depending on capitalist systems to tackle the problems of our era? The greatest limit of neoliberal capitalism is that it doesn't accept negative feedback and it lives within the illusion of endless growth. Both these limitations make neoliberal capitalism and those wholly dependent on it exceedingly vulnerable. If you haven't already subscribed to Artist as Family, you can do so by heading to our website artistasfamily.is and click on the subscribe tab. Thank you for listening.